man, I love y'all. When, uh, when Pastor Brian called me and said, hey, you got time to come and share the word with the group? I'm going to be preaching at another church. I said, of course, yes, 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 yes. And y'all been with me since the beginning. Some of y'all have really been with me down Highway 61. Two years already on the 17th, the Lord has me home. And in Livingston Parish, the Lord placed me here by his divine appointment to be a part of this detention center, which I'll be there a year already in April. Y'all been a part of that since the beginning. And here I am sitting on the second row enjoying this precious music, and in walks one of my guys. Man, this is Raymond Knight. Uh, he got out Friday, y'all, from the uh, detention center. Um, and it's his precious fiance, Stacy, which I've been able to, you know, spend time with and meet with her. And, you know, that's what we do. You know, that's what the FAIR program is that Brother Mark Carroll, you know, the Lord placed it on his heart, who's the, the other chaplain. I'm chaplain of reentry, and Brother Mark is the chaplain. It's, you know, it's family approach to inmate reentry. You know, we get these families together and teach these men, by the grace of God, operate in the role of prophet, priest, and king. And it's precious. So, you know, when the Lord breathes on me and sends one of my guys in here with y'all, man, how humbling is that? You know, we serve a mighty God, a precious God. And then I got the Tates in the back. They've been with me for so man, for seem like 100 years. I love them. And uh, it just opened up their heart to me. And they're like, just like y'all. And uh, so I'm grateful to be here. I could go on and on. But we're going to be talking a little bit this morning. John 13, the Gospel of John. Love one another. You know, we talk about these New Year's resolutions. And let me tell you about, you know, statistics. And I'm not a big statistics guy, but I guess I am in a way. They say by the first month, a resolution goes out the door. And then by Valentine's Day, everything is. So how about we talk about the real love? You know, and in, and in this, this text, we're going we're gonna to walk the text. You know, this was new. You know, Jesus gives a new commandment. This is new to John writes from his heart here. We got some new things, you know. We, if we could live this loving one another as Jesus loved us every moment, moment by moment. No, we don't need a resolution. We need a revolution. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, if God gave us you know, through Jesus Christ, gave us a new commandment, he would certainly enable us to keep that new commandment. Amen? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But we need this moment-by-moment moment grace, this moment-by-moment moment love that he has giving us a precious example. Now, love one another. And it's only his love that will sustain us moment-by-moment. Moment this new chapter, this 2024 that we're fixing to step into. So if you have your Bibles, would you open it to the Gospel of John chapter 13? And if you can, would you stand to your feet? I'm going to begin in verse 31, and we will read through verse 38. When he had gone out, this is Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? 
I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. You may be seated. It is the night before Jesus is crucified. The 12 apostles are eating with Jesus that most important meal of all meals. And Jesus had said to them, same chapter, verse 21, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. John was reclining next to Jesus and asked him in verse 25, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, probably in a low voice, so that only John could hear him. Since Judas left, the others had no idea what was actually going on. That's verse 29. It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it, verse 26. Then he dipped the bread and gave it to Judas and said, what you are going to do, do quickly. That's verse 27. And in verse 30, Judas leaves. And the next thing Jesus says, verse 31, now, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And at that very moment, when the final betrayal has been set in motion, at that moment, Jesus says, now, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now, now that the final process of being handed over to be killed is in motion, now the Son of Man, Jesus, will shine with the greatest glory, and God will shine gloriously in him. Amen? Of all his disciples, church, only John could at this moment feel the full amazement at this. John had heard Jesus say that Judas was the one, the betrayer. At that moment, he must have been truly, utterly stunned. Judas? The one we've trusted with the money? These entire three years? Verse 29. Suddenly, in a flash, a whole cluster of Judas's peculiar behaviors take on a whole new meaning like that. So this is why he gave Mary such a hard time for anointing Jesus with the expensive anointment. John chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. He wanted her to give that to Jesus so he would have access to it. Hmm. All this going through John's mind. So John watches Judas leave, and he can't believe what he's watching. And while John's mind is churning the incredible news that Judas is a betrayer and may be doing his foul work at this very moment, he hears Jesus say, now, now is the Son of Man glorified. And then another boulder is thrown into the churning waters of his mind. Glory? Now? Judas? Betrayal? Glory? And in what must have been one of the most emotionally charged moments of John's life, the next words he heard was, little children, technia in the Greek, verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know 
that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John chapter 13, verses 33 through 35. Little children, I am going where you cannot come. I am leaving you. Up to now, everyone knows you are my disciples because they see you following me around Judea as well as Galilee. You've put your life on the line by just being identified with me. But now, I will no longer be here for you to follow. Following my physical presence will not be the mark of your discipleship anymore. So I give you a new mark, a new commandment. Love one another, little children. So here's John with his heart bursting with conflicting emotions. Betrayal has been put in motion. The glory of God is about to be seen. Jesus is leaving them. And in his absence, love for each other is to bind them together and bind them to him. And in that moment of conflicting and intensified emotion, Jesus reaches for a word of singular affection and calls them all little children. Does this tell us anything, church? Little children. I think it tells us that in that very moment in the life of John the Apostle, that it was so profound and so moving and so memorable that it left its mark years later, not only the writing of this story in his gospel, but also in his entire first epistle, 1 John. And 1 John, therefore, becomes our earliest and most authoritative commentary of Jesus' new commandment. Let's consider a few things. The word, little children, technia, occurs only here in the Gospel of John. There were other places it could have been used, as when Jesus called out to the disciples in John chapter 21, verse 5, children, do you have any fish? But that's a different word. It's padia. Only here does he call his friends little children. Not only is this the only place the word is used in John, it is the only place it is used in the entire New Testament, except for one book. One book, John's first letter. And there it is used seven times in five chapters. Technia. Jesus just as he called his friends little children, the word becomes John's favorite name for his flock, little children. A coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences, divine appointment. But perhaps, but let's consider this. Nowhere else in the New Testament does the term new commandment occur outside this story. Nowhere except in John's first and second letter. It's the only time. Of all the New Testament writers, John picked up on the term. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. He says, Beloved, I'm writing you no, listen to this, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The true light is already shining. The darkness has passed away. 
So I feel constrained to believe that John was profoundly moved and shaped by this very moment at the Last Supper. And the connections with his first letter inclined me to think that the earliest and most authoritative commentary on the new commandment in John 13, verses 34 and 35, is what John says about in his first letter. Here are two striking things that we can consider here about the way John handles this new commandment. First, nowhere, I mean nowhere, in any of his letters does John refer directly to the love of Jesus for his disciples. So he never says, love each other the way Jesus loved you. He doesn't say that. He always talks about the love of God for his children, the love of the Father. When Jesus comes into the picture, the point is, God loved us in giving Jesus for us. And when it comes to the one we should model our love on, John doesn't say, love like Jesus. Listen what he says. He says, love like God. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what are we to make of this? I'm going to tell you what I make of this, is that this is exactly the way I would expect the writer of John in his gospel to talk. As John thought back on this very moment with the betrayal in motion, the glory of God about to shine, Jesus is leaving and love is binding. What overcomes him is the thought, I was leaning on the shoulder of God. God had put Judas in motion. God was about to be glorified on the cross, God told us to love each other like Jesus, that is, like God. Amen? So in his first letter, John isn't minimizing Jesus when he puts all the focus on the love of God in Jesus. He is actually maximizing Jesus. This Jesus who gave us the new commandment and told us to love each other the way he loved us, this Jesus is God incarnate. And John could not get over this truth, y'all. God was loving us there that night. God was loving us the next morning. Every act of Jesus, the Son, was an act of God the Father. John is not saying the love of Jesus is not important. He is saying the love of Jesus is the love of God. So when the new commandment says, love each other as I have loved you, it means as God has loved you. And here's a second striking thing here about the way John handles this new commandment. Jesus said in verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John pondered this very deeply. This phrase, my disciples, think about that. He pondered this deeply. And what must have happened for that to be known, my disciples. And what he concluded was that being a disciple of Jesus means being truly born again. To be a disciple is not just to be 
outwardly aligned with a Christian church or a Christian movement or a Christian name, but miraculously changed by the Spirit into a person with a new heart of love for the Father and for Jesus and for his followers. It means being born from above, anathon. And of course, here's the big one, for his enemies. But John's emphasis falls on loving fellow believers, just like Jesus did here in John 13, 34, that you love one another. And love is how you know that this is happening. Love for one another is the result of our salvation, being born from above. Especially loving our enemies. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 7. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. 1 John 3, 14. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. 1 John 3, 10. Anyone who does not love, who does not know God, because God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. We've got a plethora of scriptures verifying this. Or as Jesus says, John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. All people will have good evidence that you are born of God and know God and are children of God and are in the light and no longer in the darkness by the love that we have for one another. People will throw you under a bridge, under a bus, for a plethora of reasons, people will know that you are truly a disciple of Jesus by whether you have been given a new heart of trust in Jesus and love for his followers. And listen, church, I don't use this word trust lightly here. I don't put the word trust there just because that's the right thing to do. I included it because John thought about the new commandment, the new. He knew this new commandment, that the new commandment was not an isolated commandment to love. This is not isolation, but a commandment embedded in the call of Jesus to trust him as the sin-bearing lamb of God for everything we need. Do you really believe that? John did. Trust is huge. It's everything. We trust the doctor when we go there. We trust when we get into a vehicle, the one driving is going to drive carefully. As we're going down the road, we got a car coming the opposite way. We trust they're going to stay in the lane and not hit us head on. We trust these isolated events, and we should, but at the same time, in a whole different level and categorization, how much more should we trust Jesus, the sin-bearing lamb that redeemed us back to the Father? Our propitiation Wrath-bearing, wrath-satisfied, the penalty of sin dealt with, 
no, the power of sin dealt with. And when he returns again, the, the presence of sin, how much do we trust him that he will not only set this commandment, a new commandment to love one another, but enable us to do it every moment of the day, throughout the day, no matter how many people throw us under a, bu a, a bus, that we forgive them. Because the world's looking. The world's quick to tell us. They know more about the Bible than we do. That's the sad thing about it. Do something wrong to someone who, who's not in the, in, in, in the faith. They quick to judge. But they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're dead in their trespasses. But our love for each other verifies that we have a God of power. The tomb is really empty. And that same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that resides in every born-again believer. So I included it because when John thought about this new commandment, he knew that the new commandment was not an isolated commandment to love, but a commandment embedded in the call of Jesus to trust him as the sin-bearing lamb of God for everything we need. And we know that because John said in 1 John 3.23, he says, and this is his commandment, singular, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Amen? In other words, in John's mind, Jesus' command to believe on him and his command to love each other are inseparable. So together he calls them one commandment. This is his commandment, singular, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. People won't know you are a disciple of Jesus if you make no profession of faith in Jesus. You just keep your mouth shut. They don't know. But if you declare yourself openly to be a disciple of Jesus, your Savior, your Lord, your treasure, then your love for others will be decisive in showing that you are real. Are you a true believer? Are you really a disciple? Is he really your treasure? Have you really been changed by Jesus? They will know if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. So when Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, he meant love confirms that your profession of faith in me is real. Why is it that love proves discipleship? Great question. Why is it that when disciples love each other, there is such good evidence that they are true disciples of Jesus? Great question. Why is this one another love so compelling? Great question. The answer? The answer comes when we ponder why. Jesus calls this commandment new. Think about that. Have you ever thought about that? If we see what makes this commandment truly new, if we see what makes this commandment new, I'll say that again, we will see what makes it have such compelling power to prove true discipleship, true faith in Jesus. The commandment, y'all, to love each other is not new in itself. We go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. However, what appears to be new is the way we are to love, namely, and here's the key, y'all, as Jesus has loved us. 
Now think about that. As Jesus has loved us. Verse 34, just as I have loved you, Jesus says, you are to love one another. Never before, y'all, had the Son of God come into the world and laid down his life for his people. That had never happened before. So this degree of greatness makes this degree of sacrifice had never happened before. This is new. So Jesus is simply saying, if you imitate this kind of sacrifice in loving each other, you will be fulfilling the newness of this commandment. If we listen to what John is really saying here in his first letter about what makes this commandment new, we are going to see that there's more going on than imitation. Here's the way John put it in 1 John 2.8. He says, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. It's truly new in Jesus, and it's truly new in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. In other words, what makes this love new is that it is the arrival of the glory of the Lord, the light of the world that will one day fill the earth as water covers the sea. When the Messiah comes and brings his kingdom, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14. And Jesus is the Messiah. He is coming. His coming, no doubt, was the dawn of the kingdom of God. He was and is the light of the world. And he said in verse 31, 31 that this night, the Son of Man, this night, he's talking, this night, the Son of Man would be glorified and God in him. The night, this night, the light would shine most brightly when he lays down his life for his friends. Now think about that. Now is the time that the Son of Man would be glorified at the most darkest point, which seemed dark, but that he would be exalted. the glory of God would be most prevalent, most shining in the sacrifice. So when you connect it, why wouldn't he say that we should love one another? And by this, all men would know that you are my disciples. Because it is a sacrifice. But again, he's never going to give us something that he won't enable us to be able to carry out if you're a true disciple. Amen? And then John says in the next verse, 1 John 2, 9 and 10, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. Amen? In other words, my brothers and sisters, what makes the disciples love for each other new and this commandment for it new is that they are not just copying the light. They are in this light. They are in the love of Jesus. This is how John sees the newness of this love. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. That's what's happening that night and the next morning. And John says, that's what makes this new. And what makes the commandment new is this love was the arrival of the light of God, the glory of God at the end of the age to fill the earth. 
and the commandment for us to love each other just as Jesus loved was not mainly a commandment for imitation, but for participation. John says, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. When we love each other in obedience to this new commandment, we are loving each other with the love of Jesus. His love is being perfected in our love. This is not mainly imitation, nor participation, but manifestation. Our lives are in Jesus, in the light, and our love is his love. Jesus comes back to this in John 15 and makes the meaning super clear. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. John 15, verses 12 through 13. Yes. And a sounding yes. And how do we love like that? John 15, 9 answers that question. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This, church, is our newness. This is the new commandment. Just as I have loved you, love one another. Yes, but not by just copying my fruit, but by connecting to my vine. You don't mainly imitate, you participate. Your love for each other is not assimilation of mine, Jesus says, but a manifestation of mine. You are the branches. I am the vine. If you abide in me, you can bear fruit and prove to be my disciples. John 15, 8. This is how all people know you are truly my disciples. So the reason the love we have for each other shows that we are truly Jesus' disciples is that it is only possible because we are grafted into the life and the love of Christ. We love as he loved because we love with his love. And I think that the 1689 makes a really precious point here in chapter 18 of the assurance of grace and salvation. Paragraph 2 says, this certainty, I love this, says it a whole lot better than me, is not a bare conjectural or probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel and also upon the inward evidence of those graces of the Spirit unto which promises are made, and on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirit that we are the children of God, and as a fruit thereof, keeping the heart both humble and holy, set apart to love as Jesus loved, willing to lay down our lives, for the brethren. So body of Christ, my little children, in these crucial days, these historic days in the life of the church, this is what Jesus is calling us for among us as we step into 2024, not into a resolution, but a revolution for Jesus, dying to self and living for him being grafted into the vine. No longer living like the world, but living for him. The great I am. This is what Jesus is calling for among us. Just as I have loved you, that you, body of Christ, love one another.
Let's go low in foot washing 2024. Foot washing service for one another. Lay down your lives, your privileges for one another. Think of others' interests more important than your own. Love your brothers across all racial and ethnic lines. Love the weakest and the oldest and the youngest. Love the disabled. Love the lonely troublemaker. Been there. And I thank the Lord for the love of the body of Christ because I wouldn't be standing behind a pulpit today because that love comes straight from Jesus through y'all. It is certain that when you love, that you cannot atone for anyone's sin. We know that. But you can do something like it because love does cover a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8. So how blessed the church, especially the church in transition that loves like this. He will enable us. He will cause us through his word to see things from his point of view. And as I'm about to pray, if the, y'all want to come on up? Love is Jesus loved. Is the only way that we can do this. And apart from him, we can do nothing. I'm going to pray that there's anyone in here needs prayer. I'm going to be up front. I would love to pray for you. Anything that's going on in your life, I don't know what's going on. If you don't know the Lord, I would love to, to speak with you about that and pray for you. But you don't need me to pray for you. You can pray anywhere where you at. The Lord is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and he's sovereign. And he hears the cries of his people. And not only does he hear them, he has already enacted upon them. If anything has touched you that was spoken of, please pray and it didn't come from me, it's all from him. And you need prayer. I'll be up front. I would love to pray for you. So, Father, thank you for the word that went forth. Thank you that you've made a way through your cross. That darkness has been expelled and the glory of God has been put above all things. That in the darkest hour, your grace and mercy and love was exalted. When the world looked at the cross and saw it as shameful, and although there was a humiliation, there was an exaltation in it. And that cross, we deserve, but you took it on our behalf. That the penalty of sin would be destroyed. The power of sin. And when you come back again, Lord, the presence of sin. But we thank you for this great salvation. We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you that we no longer have a high priest that we cannot sympathize with, but you were tempted and tested at all points. And this is how and why we're able to come to your throne of grace in this time of need. So Lord, we give you this time right now. May the floodgates of heaven open up right now. We thank you, Lord. We praise you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name we say.